turn. All right, thanks, Sinamar, for that nice introduction. And thank you, everybody, for logging on. It's, uh, it's always fun and exciting to present for Tropy Lunch. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about uh, doing a methods talk today, which is, uh, which is a bit of a deviation from past talks, where I've been talking about my research results. Um, but the reason is, is because I kind of accidentally stumbled upon slash created this method based on uh, my experiences in the field, and especially my lack of ability to actually get information uh, from sensitive populations on challenging subjects like migration and violence. So um, before we get started, I do want to just make one small comment. I think this is important because my study is based on violence and migration and very sensitive topics. I just want to make it clear that nobody, none of these pictures are of individuals who took place in my, uh, who participated in my study. These are all images either from when I was in Peace Corps, from my just personal photos that I've taken while in Honduras, or from the Creative Commons. So nobody in these in these pictures actually took place, uh, participated in any of this research. Okay, so today we're gonna be talking about reciprocal peer interviews. And what is that? The easiest definition here is that I term it as participants in dyads or in pairs, um, acting as the interviewer and the interviewee in turn. It sounds very simple, but, uh, but you'll see that it, it yields really interesting results. So <clears throat> I do wanna make clear that this is not the same as the peer interview method where you, some of you may be familiar with, where you find a community insider, uh, you train that person and then you pay that person to be the researcher in lieu of you. Um, this is commonly used to, to be able to enter into sensitive topics with sensitive populations. You see that method used with, with things like um, drug um, cartels, with gangs, with um, prostitution, and so on. This is different because this is not remunerated, um, and it's more of, a, uh, of an exchange between two individuals than it is a paid researcher. The reason for that is because the paid researcher, even if they are quote-unquote community insider, once you pay them, you train them, you've essentially changed their social location in the community, and you have introduced a whole other set of challenges that, you know, some of which um, can actually be detrimental to the data collection. I won't get too much into that. I'm happy to talk about that um, as a question later on, but I just want to make clear that there is a distinction uh, between these two methods. So this took place um, in first in the pilot study for a project that I did looking at rural livelihoods and the connection between climate change, um, the deterioration of rural livelihoods and how that is leading to violence and migration as primary livelihood strategies. So you can see there are those words, violence, migration. These are very sensitive topics. Um, they're very important topics. And in a country like Honduras, where there's a high level of violence and very low levels of prosecution or any type of um, of um, consequences for violence, that these topics can put people in actual danger. And so even in terms of ethics review and IRB, um, it was quite difficult to get this project through the ethics review board and the IRB process because we're also talking about youth. So my study population included youth ages between 12 and 27. Um, I'm asking them topics about very personal matters um, I'm asking them about a violence that has occurred in their communities, that has occurred against their family members. They could divulge very sensitive information that if it got into the wrong hands could genuinely put people in danger. And so even in terms of ethics, I had to really think through how I was going to do this study and keep my participants safe. So the original uh, methods that I decided on in the pilot study were traditional interviews and focus groups. And I chose these two methods to begin with because as the researcher, I thought to myself, okay, if I'm gonna keep my participants safe, if I talk, out, talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, it'll just be me. Nobody else will hear what they tell me. I can record it. I can keep it close to the chest. They can feel comfortable talking to me. And then focus groups, when the questions were adapted a bit for focus groups, so they weren't quite as, um, as loaded. Um, but then, you know, with the focus groups, I can get that co-construction of meaning of four or five youth who together can kind of talk about the issues that they're facing, what's going on in their communities. And again, it's just me, so I can record it. I can keep it close to my chest. I thought this was going to be a great idea. And I'm, I will say that I think I'm pretty good 
at getting people to talk to me. I mean, even as a community outsider, I was very aware of all the challenges in terms of getting people to speak to you. But, you know, I had had success in the past on other topics and getting people who are not like me at all to talk to me about sensitive subjects, or I should say, talk to me about um, subjects, um, not sensitive subjects, but subjects of interest to them. So this is what ended up happening. <laughs> My interviews and focus groups, when I got rid of the many, 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 many minutes of silence and awkwardness and my enumerators just trying everything they possibly could to get people to talk to them. My average for my focus group and interviews was five minutes and 49 seconds of information, which was all yes or no answers. <laughs> They didn't say a word. They barely said anything. And anything that they did tell, said that they did actually divulge, was drawn out of them by the enumerator, by the interviewer, in a way where they were basically just parroting what that person had said to them, what they were trying to get out of them. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, we've got violence in the community, you know, type issues. It was absolutely worthless information. There was nothing usable in my, in my data. And I just imagine that this is what like these kids are thinking, you know, like, who is this person? Why is she talking to me? Just go away and leave me alone. And I'm actually quite confident that that's what they were thinking. So why did this fail? And I've been well trained by TCD, by MDP, by UF, SNRE, and I, I, I know what I'm supposed to do, but there's some real important issues at play when we go in as researchers into a community where we are the community outsider and we are the researcher and we're bringing in things like social location where we are not at all uh, a part of that community, a part of the, the lifestyle. I'm actually a highly educated white female academic coming out of the United States, flying into Honduras, you know, taking my, my paid driver to, to take me to these rural communities and I get out of my nice little truck and I walk up and I try to get people to tell me about their lives. I mean, that's really not very realistic because we are at a completely different social locations. Um, in addition, the power dynamics there of me coming in as an outsider and asking people to tell me about their personal lives. But there's also different ways of knowing, right? So the way that we communicate to each other and the way that we use language is different based on who we are with. Even us, you know, day to day, who I, when I'm talking to my partner versus my students versus my friends, the way that I create information, the way that I share information, and even the words that I use are different. And so if you come in as an outsider into a situation and you assume that you can rapidly create a rapport, an authentic rapport with somebody, um, even after what we talk about, like sharing a cup of coffee, talking about their lives, you know, you're taking an hour of this person's life and assuming they're going to divulge sensitive information to you. Um, what that, you know, what that also talks about is this lack of authenticity. You know, are the accounts that you're getting when you go into a situation like that actual real accounts or are they a version of accounts that have been divulged to you based on all these other issues that they are adapting because you're the stranger sitting in their house, right? And then there's also this issue of cognitive authority. Like who am I as the outsider to come in and dictate what questions are asked, dictate how, they're at, how they are asked, uh, dictate the direction of the conversation, and then go back to my home country as the expert researcher, quote unquote, using my own cognitive authority rather than their actual lived experiences. So Bordeaux would actually call this symbolic violence. So this is essentially, you know, when we are being really critical of ourselves as researchers, this is actually a form of violence to come into a community like this and assume that you can establish these relationships and interpret that information in a way that then goes on and influences things like policy, right? So there's real issues here in the way in which that we create information. And I love this picture because this look on this kid's face to me says it all, right? So this is a person from an NGO who's coming in, pro probably just like me, spending a day in the community and he's uh, she's over here talking to these kids and giving them high fives and just the lack of authenticity there even if you're well-meaning right even if you're coming at it from the best possible uh, uh point of view and position and intention that is not what is seen on the other side so you know i see this kid and he I, I imagine he's probably thinking to himself like are you serious right now you're gonna give me a high five i don't even know you right so my interviews were essentially just cricket sounds. 
you know, and I was absolutely in a panic when I got that data back because the truth of the matter is as a researcher, um, I do need to understand what's going on, right? I do, I do have um, research questions and yeah, I mean, like in terms of what that, where that research question is coming from, I could co-create that with the community. There's a lot of better ways that I could go about doing that. But the main issue at this point and when I was in the field was I got to answer these questions because USAID has asked me to figure out what's going on and that is going to in turn influence five years of their programming. So this is serious, you know, it's not a matter of the fact that kids won't talk to me. It's a matter of that I'm not getting the information I need and the information I have is not really authentic, right? So I start, I really did panic. You know, I think I cried about it as a matter of fact. So then I thought, okay, let's take a step back. Let's calm down and think to myself, if I was a 15 year old, who would I actually talk to, right? Who would I actually share information with? And this obvious answer, they'll talk to each other, right? They're friends. And the reality is these young people are already talking about these subjects. You know, like they may not be going off of my script and asking my exact questions, but you know, we would be foolish to assume that people in Honduras are not talking about migration and violence in very sincere, very important ways. So then I thought to myself, okay, how do I get young people to talk to each other about these topics in a way that I can get data? And so then I realized well, there's this great tool called empathic listening right? Shout out to John and his facilitation skills and conflict management classes, which now I teach one of those now myself, and I teach students empathic listening. And I realized I've been using empathic listening skills in my one-on-one -on -one interviews, you know, to draw people out in terms of mirroring what they're saying, you know, um, checking my perceptions, all of these great skills that you, you use when you learn how to properly listen and get people to actually speak in a way that they want to speak. So I thought, okay, how can I adapt empathic listening? So this is what we ended up doing in our pilot. We found six kids or so in each school. I mean, always did gender specific because violence migration is highly gendered in terms of the implications there. So we made sure that boys talk to boys and girls talk to girls. And we gave them a training, right? Okay, so we taught them, we didn't necessarily go into things like body language and the way that you sit because these are kids and they're gonna have natural conversations with one another. Right, I should say youth because they are, we're all the way up to 27 years old. But we did go through like listening for cues, listening for key things, and then following up with a prompt, right? Maybe the prompt that I gave, but they were also open to create their own prompts and just react to the conversation they're having with their friends. How to ask follow-up questions, essentially how to listen and how to get your friend to talk to you. Then we did a practice activity. Okay. We use the format of a popular radio show in Honduras, Ache Ariane, and it's one of the, it's a great, it's a great show, but it's essentially this, this kind of overdone interview style. And because it was familiar to the kids or to the youth, they latched onto that really quickly, really got in it. They would even like hold fake microphones up to each other, you know, like they were interviewing each other in the roads, uh, in the street. And then there's the first uh, practice activity, we use low stakes questions. You know, like, what's your favorite animal? What, what do you hope to do after school? Very low stakes, just to kind of get them familiar with the process. And then we talked about it. So how did it go? What prompts did you give? You know, what follow-up questions do you ask? What was hard and, and what can we do? How can we do it better? So then we did another practice activity. Slightly more challenging questions, right? So that we can see, okay, now that you've gotten through the easy stuff, let's try this again. But let's try it with some slightly harder questions. And then again, we had a discussion about it. How did it go? You know, what did you ask? Why did you ask it? How did you feel when you were asked the questions? Did you feel like you wanted to share? What made you feel like you wanted to share? And so we would kind of go through this process of unpacking um, what worked and what didn't work for them in their own conversation, the way that they wanted to go about it. And they actually really ended up kind of, kind of getting into it. So then at that point, I gave them record, a recording device and they were instructed to take turns interviewing one another recorded. Um, during our practice, we made sure that they knew that they could, they had a set of questions and they had a set of follow-up questions that we kind of developed. However, they were told, you can take this discussion anywhere you want. 
right? So giving over the autonomy, letting go as the researcher. Like, I would love it if you talk about these things because I'd like to know about these things. But if you want to go off script, you can talk about whatever you want. You can ask whatever questions that you want. And the reason for that, for one, is letting go as a researcher, giving them their own autonomy, but also trusting that, you know, that these individuals they know these topics, they know what's important, they know what they would like to communicate and they would talk about and what they are willing to share knowing that they are being recorded, right? So that recording device is still there. However, one of the things that I noticed very quickly is that most of the participants forget about the recording device and just start talking to each other like a normal conversation. So there was no researcher present you know, each pair had their own recording device. They went off on their own, wherever they wanted. They had as much time as they needed. They could take 15 minutes or two hours if they wanted. And I made sure that they knew that that recording device was password protected. Again, violence and issues of violence in Honduras. If I, for some reason, got robbed on my way out of a community and those devices were stolen, if they were not password protected, I could be putting those youth in direct danger. And so we made sure that all of these devices were not only password protected, but that only myself and I, the other enumerators knew the password and that they knew that their information was being protected. So this ended up being reciprocal peer interviewing. Peers who are lightly trained to interview one another in turns. So how did it go when we started do, using this? The first in the, in the pilots, um, we did this with 20 pairs, so 40 kids, 20 female, 20 male, roughly. And this time, getting rid of all the silences and, you know, whatever, our average was 20 minutes of data. And it was not yes and no, it was data. And in some cases, it was, in many cases, I should say, it was deep discussion beyond the script, off of the script, two young people having a conversation with each other about real issues that are affecting their lives. And that was the average. I had some go up to an hour and I had some that were shorter, 10 or 15 minutes, you know, because kids are kids and some say they want to participate, but they don't really. Others just really get into it and just start talking. So with that said, there are some challenges here. And these are known challenges in, for any method, but I think it's important that we unpack those for this particular method. So one of those is interview is performance, right? And so here's an example. This guy, these are two young men. And they're like, all right, man, what are your hopes for the future? He says, you know, he's just going to joke around. Like, I'm going to be a millionaire. I want to be like Cristiano, Ronaldo, or Messi. I'm going to beat up all my enemies and kill them, right? Obviously, it's not usable data for me. That's not really, they're joking around. They're messing around. Um, and his friends, like, they're laughing. You know, they're just really joshing with each other. And he's like, nah, not kill my enemies. You know, I'll put them in jail. Uh, like, imagine Cristiano, the best soccer player. That sucker has money the best life, that's what I want, right? So you would think when you hear this, you're like, oh great, I'm just gonna have a 45 minute recording of these two guys messing around. But they went on. They stopped joking around and got back to the script eventually. And he's like, nah, man, you know, what it actually is is that here in Honduras, it's really difficult. And he goes on and starts actually answering the question. So yeah, you may get kids that goof around, but that's just also part of natural conversation. Right? These, are, these are young people with their friends having these discussions. And so they go off script into completely useless information for me land. But for them, they're establishing rapport. They are talking to their friend. They're relaxing. They're getting into the discussion. And yeah, they're joking around, but that's okay. I did not have any interviews that were just kids messing around. None. Okay, so then the next issue is the skill of the interviewer. And this is where I think that we have a really hard time as researchers letting go. Because we feel like we are trained, we are the expert, we know what we want to ask, we know how to dig for it. And there's no way that these young people are going to be able to do that, right? So they don't have the skills. And my half hour, 45 minute training session is not going to give them the same skills that we've gotten in years and years of, of, um, of studying, right? And that's, that's a fair critique. So let's look at this one. This is a good example of that lack of skill. We have this young lady who says, you know, answer, ask the question, tell me a story. And all of my questions, by the way, took this format of tell me a story about, not necessarily tell me how you have been affected by, by violence, but tell me a story about somebody you know. That in part was, 
IRB, an ethics review, it was also in part purposely done so that people would feel comfortable telling any story they wanted. And I would say nine out of 10 times that story ended up being about them or somebody they knew directly in their family, right? But opening that up to them for, for that to be an option is less threatening in terms of the questions that, that we're asking. So tell me a story about a girl that you know and how violence has influenced her life differently than life of a boy. And so the FEMA goes, okay, parents can hit a girl at home. Uh, for a boy, you only tell them what they shouldn't do, but a girl gets hit more than a boy. And then the interviewer just goes on to the next question, right? So that's, if, if, I, if I was the one interviewing as, a, as an experienced researcher, I would ask a follow-up question of some kind, you know, or I would mirror them. Like, what do you mean? Like, what, what, why, why do you think that a girl would get hit more than a boy? You know, and why, why are they just telling, you know, I would ask something to try to get them to keep talking about this topic, but the kids would just go right to the next question on the script. So I've lost some information there. And here's another example, you know, tell, tell me a story about a young person who's participated in violence or crime. And so the person says, well, many more men than women that I have known, you know, have participated in violence, more men than women. And they go on and they talk for a while. And then later in the interview, the, the, the interviewer asks, you know, do you think that violence influences the life of women and men differently? And the participant says, no. So again, as a skilled researcher, I'm gonna remember like, well, earlier you said this, and I'm gonna ask some kind of a follow-up question to try to clarify, to understand, you know, so why do you think that there isn't, you know, if this is, you know, some of what you brought up earlier, can you explain? And I would probably get some more really good information about that, except that the kids would never tell me any of this, right? All right, so next, again, tell me a story about a young person that has participated in crime and violence. And this student goes on, a young person goes on to say, yeah, it was a carpenter, a friend of my mom's, a low level delinquent, and, you know, what kind of, the, the, the kid interrupts. Well, what kind of benefits did he get? Just wants to go to the next question. Like, come on, let's get through this, let's get through this. Or I want to get to my turn is something that I also saw. Like, I want you to hurry up so that I get to be the one to answer the questions, which is a good thing in a way. So the, the other student yells, like, hold on a minute, I'm not done yet. You know, you're interrupting me, right? Again, as a skilled researcher, that is not something you want to do, is interrupt your participant. And, and move them on, hurry them to the next question because you're, you're, you're gonna lose their train of thought. You're not gonna get the information you need. So again, when I heard that, there was a little part of me that cringed, right? That the student was rushing the other person on. And it's not very often that you're gonna have a participant who yells at their, yells and says, hold on a minute, I'm not done yet, and just keeps going. Luckily, this, this young person did, but it's not something you're gonna see terribly often. And then we have the ethical challenges, right? And the ethical challenges are tough in this project to begin with. So there were a lot of protocols in place, a lot of things that we had to really think through uh, to keep our participants and the data safe. So let's look about one ethical issue. So why do you think a young person would choose to participate in violence? You know, the key here is that this individual, when she responds, she gives names, she gives community names, she talks about specific people, and I have that all recorded, right? And it's not just her, it happened a lot. I could tell you where gangs are located in the rural areas. I can tell you which communities are drug depots that are storing and distributing drugs and trafficking across the mountains. All of this information, the students, when, when they forget the cameras on, when they start talking, they just talk about these things specific crimes and specific names, right? So there's a couple of different issues here. One of them is I have to keep them safe, right? And the one of the questions IRB asked me was, how are you going to ensure that the other person doesn't tell everybody what their partner said? That's a very important question and it's a very valid question. And the answer to that was essentially, by changing the way that I asked the questions to being, tell me a story about, so that it signals to the participant that they do not have to give any specifics. They don't have to give, tell them a story about their own life or their own community. They can talk about other places, other people. They can anonymize it however they want to respond to the question. Also, because the researcher, me, is not present, the student does not have to answer the question. 
right? They were clearly instructed, you do not have to ask any of these questions. You can skip whatever you want. Um, and, you know, the student could just say, I'm not going to answer that. There's nobody forcing them or, or encouraging them or trying to, to make them answer by asking 10 different kinds of ways, by, you know, rephrasing the question eight times, by pushing to try to get that response. The autonomy, the, the, the um, decision to answer the question is placed on the participant. And so in that sense, if they trust the other participant enough to answer the question, then we assume that it is on, that they have some type of reciprocal relationship or some type of already established trust where they're then not gonna go divulge that information. Now, again, this is relying on the fact that these young people know each other and they also have already been talking about these topics. So again, these are not new things that they're suddenly divulging, but we assume that they, that they are already talking about these things. However, this is a big deal and we do want to be very cognizant of the ethics of, of the method. So then we also come to assumptions of homogeneity. And this is where when I first tried this method, I just made a huge mistake, right? So here's a great example. As you can look down in the purple, you'll see pause, no response, pause, no response, pause, no response. It was just like my interview or my focus groups where I was getting zero information. Right. So what happened there? Well, it's as simple as this great quote. Social networks are not made up of consensus groups, but include relationships of conflict and mistrust. Right. So foolish of me to assume that people within the community would just be willing to talk to each other. And in this particular instance, I had it was an, um, an after school group of kids who were willing to stay and talk with me. And I, I you know, we paired them off and the training and the whole thing. But this particular pair, and I remember it well because I was wondering about it when it happened, was a young man who was probably in his early 20s and another young man who was probably 14 or 15, right? So there was too much of a difference between them for them to actually have that established trust. They knew each other, but they might not have been friends. They might, not, they might have had conflict of some kind. And so me pairing them was an error in terms of, of the method. And I just like, again, I assume this guy is like, I'm not telling this guy anything, you know, I'm not gonna answer these questions. And so that was an example of a recording that was just didn't work. So that's when I realized like, hello, who would you wanna talk to? Your friend, somebody who you trust, right? So I adapted the method and said, okay, this time, instead of pairing people, I'm gonna choose three or four male students. Let's use them as the example. And then I'm gonna say, this is what we're doing. This is the consent. This is, you know, explanation of the activity. This is what we'll be talking about. Are you willing to participate? And, and if they are, great. And then I'll say, go find a friend that you wanna to talk to and bring them back. So then I gave them 10 or 15 minutes to go to school, go to their classroom or any other classroom, or, you know, even if they were close enough to somebody down the road to grab somebody and bring them back, a friend that they chose to speak to. And then we went through the consent process again, explained everything again, gave that, um, that other person a chance to say that they don't want to participate, which happened every once in a while, but really didn't overall. And, um, and then just did the same activity again, the same process again, but with the people that they, choose to speak, they chose to speak to. And it made a significant difference in our results because they end up just, cho just choosing a, a really good friend. And in a few cases, the, the young people would say, you know, can I just talk to the microphone myself? And my answer was, sure, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely, you can talk to the microphone yourself. Um, you know, adapt to whatever it is that they want. So in terms of the advantages, there are many. You know, it attunes the social, lo social location and the best way that you can, given limited time and circumstances and the research parameters, right? Um, it does attune to ways of knowing because you're giving the power over to the participants to speak in the way they want about the topics they want to let them deviate from what your scripted questions are. Um, you rely on existing rapport and friendships and with the assumption, and it is an assumption, but with the assumption that that is going to um, have an already created social bond that will allow people to more freely speak to one another. Um, it relies on the co-construction of knowledge between people within the community rather than you influencing that as the outsider asking the questions. 
it assumes trust and autonomy. Um, there's greater ownership and buy-in. So we actually saw kids participating. Um, it feels more natural, even when you listen to the recording. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it helps attune to representation. So I'm not gonna read all this, but I, what I want you to see here is kind of these key highlighted words. So this is a really rich discussion, one of the ones that we got uh, from this method. And you can see that they're talking about serious topics here, drugs, uh, men hitting their wives or domestic violence. Um, also women's roles in gangs. Um, they're talking about violence um, that, that the president says that violence has decreased, but they don't believe it because it's happening in their own communities. They're talking about the police being the same ones committing the crimes. The police are selling marijuana. They buy marijuana. They pass money through the communities and nobody says anything. They're talking about gangs. They're talking about family members being beaten. They're talking about the police are owned by the narco traffickers, right? They're talking about threats. Um, and, and as John mentioned, yes, it also contributes to the critical reflection on the part of the participants. Thank you, John, for pointing that out. And so like, again, this is all the information that I, I was looking for that I was not getting in, in other methods and rich information, right? And then the other interesting thing was that it is and many of the students it changed from an interview to a concert conversation, right? And you can see that with the highlighted here. You know, you, you, you lose who's the actual interviewer and who's the actual interviewee. Great, I don't care, that's fine. I'll analyze it as a conversation, right? It becomes, you know, again, you can adapt your analysis to this and very easily. But what's important here is that they are speaking to one another, right? They're, they're, they're just giving you the information and it doesn't really matter if one person is the interviewer and one person is the respondent and that formal relationship stays. As a matter of fact, I don't want that formal relationship to stay. I would prefer that they go into just talking right? And the recording device is forgotten. And then they just are, are talking about these topics. And then similarly here, we get this inside account, you know, what is happening here in this community and, and you know, with these particular neighbors. And then this last sentence, you know, really was important for me. And as Hondurans, as youth, we know the authorities know all of this. Right, so again, like from their perspectives rather than from my own, okay. Um, and here's another, another one. And again, this one is, is, uh, is interesting to me because again, with this insider account and these lived experiences, I, you also get this sense of fear that's kind of pervasive in Honduras. You know, our fear of leaving homes is much more, but then you get this interesting critical data. Crime is something necessary for some people right? I want to unpack that as, as a researcher. So why do you think that crime is necessary for some people? Like, let's get to the bottom of this. And then they go on and talk. For, for them, it's like power, right? So they're getting, this is what I'm talking about in depth of the data, you know, not surface level stuff, but really deep thoughts about these topics. So when I did this for the full Rural Livelihoods and Violence study, which was a much larger study, um, we had 94, we did 94 RPIs, which was 188 participants across five municipalities. Um, so we had 120 usable interviews and that's 67 female and 53 male. So hold on, Becky, what happened to the other 68? Like, does this method actually work? All right, so here's what happened. A few times we had tech glitches, forgot to turn on the recording device or the recording device ran out of batteries or whatever technical drama that we always have, right? And there were several occasions, many occasions, really, if I'd say out of the 98 or 94, probably 15 or 20 of them really turned into conversations between the two individuals. So turning it around and having the other person interview didn't really actually make any sense because they'd already talked about everything. So they would bring the recording back, device back, and I would say, you know, we'd say, like, did you, did you interview both, both of you interview each other? And they said, well, no, because we just talked about everything. Okay, great. That's fine. Um, in some cases, the first interview took a really long time. And so when it was time to switch, the other person was like, yeah, I'm tired. And that's okay. You know, that's, again, that's their choice. That's their autonomy. But the, the first conversation would yield like 45 minutes of information. And then sometimes they forgot to interview their counterpart. And for me, I consider this, you know, dec them deciding that they, they didn't want to in some cases. 
Okay, I think my internet cut out for just a brief second there. And then there, obviously, there are also cases where the kids didn't actually want to participate. And you all have experienced this where somebody agrees to do an interview and then they don't really speak to you. Uh, same thing, right? They say, yeah, I'll do it. And then when they really get into it, they don't really want to answer the questions. And so like, I see this as this kid being like, you know, I just got out of class for an hour. And that's okay, you know, that's all right. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I did a lot of for typical peer interviews because I can do as many pairs as I have recording devices. So if I have five recording devices, I can get 10 interviews. And even if 20% of them fail, I'm still getting seven, eight interviews, you know, out of a single, you know, uh, day with the students. All right, so again, um, the full um, study, we used four different instruments um, because we had a lot of, of information that we needed to ask. And so we did a male to male migration instrument, a female to female migration, male to male violence, and female to female violence questionnaires. Um, we ended up with over hundred hours of data um, when including when it was analyzed 40 categories and over 191 different themes related to these topics. Around 700 really good illustrative quotes. That is a mountain of information. All right, so I'm going to open it up to your questions and comments and thoughts. But if you want to know more about how to adapt this or actually use it for your own research, um, I'll be giving a two hour workshop in the Women and Gender Development Conference hosted by Virginia Tech. And that workshop will be on February 24th from 10.30 to 12.30. And that will be a workshop style format. So rather than lecture, there'll be a lot more of how we did it and replicating that together as a group. And I will also be accompanied by um, Hannah Toombs, who's uh, in my facilitation skills class and is also um, going to be working with me on this workshop. So um, I'm going to go ahead and stop there and just open it up to questions and uh, comments. And I hope that you try out the method.